Um, a very wise friend of mine told me that life begins at 40. And little did I know he was talking about bacterial growth and not people um, beginning life at 40. So that's one of the big things I want you guys to think about is if you're trying to preserve something, you know, 40 degrees and higher, you run a risk of bacteria getting growing in your whatever you're putting up. So with that, Benji, why don't you go to our first screen? So we're going to start out talking about fish today. Um, that's one of my favorite things to do is go out and catch fish. I don't keep a whole lot of fish because we don't eat a whole lot of fish in our house. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about smoking fish, pickling fish, um, just straight freezing fish to use later, and canning fish a little bit. Yep. Craig, you want to talk about upland birds? So your grouse, your pheasants, your ducks, your geese, even turkey would be an upland bird. And, um, you know, putting that up, freezing is going to last 9 to 12 months. Smoking is going to give you a unique flavor, but, you know, you, uh, you're still going to want to protect that for that 9 to 12 months that you might be holding on to it. Okay, go ahead to the yep. next one there. The next one we're going to cover probably fairly extensively is big game. So we have uh, Craig and I helped James Burnham, our R3 coordinator on the left there in the orange hat, butcher up some deer for our learn to hunt program. So uh, like Craig was saying, one of the important things when you get any game is to cool it down fast, right? So you right. can see all the students here. We pulled those carcasses out of a, well, they were frozen, thawed them out, butchered that up, and that went straight into coolers from there. So keep mm -hmm. that, keep all that meat and everything as cold as you can. And with our learn to hunt class, it was so warm this year. One of the issues was, you know, we can't leave that thing hanging in a tree too long. So the one we got in St. Croix Valley, we quartered that out and got that right into coolers right away, just within hours after um, harvesting the deer. So, And it's going to be warm this weekend. So if you're going out deer hunting, make a plan ahead of time. Um, get that deer in a cool shaded garage or shed, whatever you've got, and pull that hide off so that the heat can escape. That hide's an insulation layer, and it's going to trap that heat in the animal. So take the hide yeah. off, let it get cooled down before you start uh, processing. So my contact and phone number is up there. Oh, yep, I can put that up there. If you have any questions, I, I think we should mention too, Craig, you know, we've talked a little bit about harvesting of, of big game and stuff. And we have a great series online yep. too, about how to process your game, how to butcher a deer and stuff. So if you go to the DNR website, either through our MOS program, mndnr.gov slash discover, we get you there. Or if you look at the learn to hunt pages, there's also some videos attached there where you can, if you want to dive into that part of it, how to butcher deer and how to care for that. There's some great videos on there for this. I think with this, Craig, we can jump into your kitchen there. And sure. I'm going to stop this PowerPoint here, give you the presenter ball. And if anybody has any questions, if Craig isn't showing up center screen on you, if you go up to the top, just hover over his picture, click that little ellipsis there and have click move to stage that'll center him on your stage for for you so so i believe the first thing that we had on our list was fish and uh, smoking of fish has been a way of preservation uh, removing that excess moisture and one of the keys that i've used is brining the fish and it's usually a salt and water solution you can add other flavorings to it um, might be brown sugar or um, whatever you like, but you brine the fish for oh, 12 to 24 hours, depending on you know how how salty or how sweet you want it, and then uh, follow the directions of your smoker. And if you've got a commercial or a you know professional style smoker, that's great. Um, I think my first smoker was an old metal refrigerator that we uh, that we used. 
and uh, that worked out really slick. I've used a Coleman, or not a Coleman, um, the black kettle looking uh, barbecue. And we put coals in the bottom and a pan of uh, chips, wood chips on it and use that for a smoker, uh, pretty small batches. But um, it's one way to, to utilize something you already have um, to smoke your fish. And there's lots and lots and lots of links online on temperature and duration. Uh, the key to smoking fish, in my opinion, is a fairly cool or cold fire uh, under 200 degrees if you can get it down in that, that realm and uh, pour the smoke to it, let the moisture evaporate from that fish and uh, go ahead and you can put it in the refrigerator and enjoy a fillet of sucker or white fish or whatever. Um, a friend of ours from the DNR presented us with this jar. And this is smoked white fish that they went out and collected. Uh, they collected the white fish, cleaned them up and smoked them. And then they canned them in their pressure canner. And this is gonna last four years on your shelf. Um, I've had some of his smoked canned fish. It's very flavorful. Um, one of the tricks, one of my older aunts would put a couple drops of uh, red food coloring and it looked like salmon in the jar. Um, and you could use it just like you'd use any other fish product. Um, let's move on to fresh fish. Go ahead, Ben. You see, there is a little bit different. Um, if you if you look online, some of the links we'll we'll put in the chat area. And some of the fattier fish, they recommend you brining that a little bit longer than some of the other fish. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I used to do a fair amount of archery for carp, we would brine those a little bit longer, and they were great with some uh, lemon pepper seasoning on the smoker. And then the smoking doesn't necessarily preserve it really long; it'll last three or four days in the refrigerator. But if you smoke it and either Craig's going to show you vacuum sealed here a little bit later or freeze that in a freezer bag. It can last quite a while and then you can pull that out and use it, you know, eat it at a later date. So, yeah. So, fish that you would want to um, fry in a pan, deep fry, walleyes, trout, that kind of stuff. A uh, couple of methods that some of my friends had used. These are walleye fillets, and you can see that there's a one inch strip of skin on there to meet the, the fish storage rules that we have, one on this side too. Um, that way the, the warden, if he comes and looks in your freezer, you've got that one inch patch and he knows exactly what kind of fish that is. They, uh, they froze the fillets uh, flat, and then they took and put the two fillets together and wrapped it in saran wrap so the air can't get in there. And um, that works really well. Uh, one of the other things that we used to do a lot is take a milk jug and you'd put your fillets into the milk jug, fill the jug with water because the water is going to prevent the air from getting to your fish. Yep. And then you just put it in your freezer, freeze it solid. You can close the top off. And uh, we used to just put a couple staples in there and you'd have that frozen fish in that jug. You can stack them sideways after they've frozen and uh, makes a nice container for uh, storing your fish in. And they used to be able to buy commercial storage units built out of that. Um, my buddy Nate got us a mess of trout and uh, you can see that it's still got the uh, skin on it. So you can definitely see that it's a trout in there. And what his method was, fill the bag and then roll the bag up and pinch the seal. Yeah, that's Pinching one of my favorite methods for fish too, is make sure to use, not just use a, a Ziploc you grab out of your drawer that you pack your kid's sandwich in, but grab an actual freezer Ziploc bag because they are a little heavier, they'll protect that. And Craig's talked a couple times about the uh, the theme of air, B 
besides the temperature four degrees and above, your your bacteria starts growing, but air is what's going to cause that freezer burn and stuff freezer to set burn. it too. So make sure that you yep. get all the air you can out of there. And one way with fish, which is I think probably most susceptible to freezer burn, is um, just submerging, simply submerging in water. So, yep, tackle in water, and and that pushes all the air out of the container. I have used um, the freezer bags and put a little water on top of a fillet or two that I had in there, and that sealed it in even better. Um, you know, it just the, the sandwich ones like I have here are just much thinner plastic, and they're not going to hold up in the freezer. And if you guys have ever heard of a vacuum sealer, the bags are are much heavier, um, and you can lay your fish in there so they're really nice and visible. They're not bunched up. Um, they'll stack nice and flat in your freezer, and you can write on there what kind of fish it is. Make sure you got that one inch patch of skin, and um, yeah, you'll have you know fish throughout the winter so that uh, you can taste the sunshine in the middle of January from that fishing trip out on the lake. So that's that's what I've got for packaging up your fish. Um, we were very fortunate that uh, Lindsay Chartel and Cooper and Durden, her pointers, went out last night and she was able to get us a grouse. So these are the, the grouse fillets. Um, we talked about, you know, do we actually want to show you guys cutting the, the, the breast meat off the bird? And it wasn't really designed to be a, a butchering class. What we wanted to show you was how to how to package that up. So I'm going to try and tilt my camera down, Benji. Let me know when you can see the work area here. Oh, just yeah. a, just a tad more, right there. Perfect. Perfect. So this is just a vacuum sealer. Um, it's probably our second one that we've gone through, and you just push the button. So I'm going to take all the air out. It's going to seal the bag down. So it's going to trap that vacuum in the bag. And then what I like to do is I will slide the bag up, close it again, and give it a second, just the, the seal treatment, not the vacuum part. And that gives me a double seal on the bag. Craig, have you ever had any issues with those bags getting punctured in the freezer or anything? Or I have. You know, there's been a couple of times where um, the the bags got beat up by something else that fell on them, and uh, you'll notice that there's air getting in that one. I would use that one right away. You could also use the uh, milk carton method, label it a grouse, and um, Fill it with water to pack your your grouse meat away. I like to write what it is and the date that we got it, so that you can go through your uh, freezer and find the stuff that's a little bit older that you want to use up first. And I don't know if you can see this one, but this is uh, the grouse legs here, and she also got three woodcocks that she gave us. And what I like to do with the legs and thighs from game birds, they can be a little bit um, sinewy. And, you know, even if you put them in the crock pot, they might not be super tender. But I'll take and package them up. And this one's already been sealed. Um, now I've got the fixings for uh, a wild grouse or woodcock um, base for making a soup. And you can boil that down, you can peel the meat off the bones, and the flavoring from the birds is gonna be in the water, a little onion, a little celery, and you've got what you need to you know, start your, your soup base from. And um, so that's a good one there. These are sealed up woodcock fillets. And um, 
what I what I did last night is I soaked them in a little bit of salt water to help pull the blood out of the meat. Um, I figure you guys didn't need to didn't need to see that um, part. But what I'm going to do with these woodcock breasts is I've got some pepperoni peppers in the refrigerator. They're they're uh, they're about as um, hot as a, just a pickle. I mean a dill pickle. But they've got some nice flavor in them. I'll take a sliver of pepperoni, a little bit of cheese. I've used pepper jack. I've used um, Philly. Wrap that in bacon. Put it on the grill, and grill it until the the bacon is nice and and done and crispy. And that's usually long enough to get the um, woodcock breast done too. And it makes a nice little hors d'oeuvre, uh, something outdoorsy to use. And for you folks that are working on bringing a, a dog along, I actually sealed the, the wings and the tail feathers and one of those canvas dummies for uh, dog training. I'll take and attach a wing or a tail fan uh, to that dummy to get the dog used to the smell and also the texture of the feathers in his mouth or her mouth because they just that's something new and foreign to them, and they may not appreciate that too much. Uh, I was looking in the uh, official canning book here, and uh, there was some recipes on canning ducks, um, goose, turkey, and game birds. So you could actually uh, can up and, and have uh, very tender meat in there, and you could heat it up and have a, a very quick meal from that. So that's pretty yeah. much what's left in there. Anything else on birds that you do different, Benji? You, you know, some of the bird hunting I've done, some people like to hang their birds and age them for a little bit. It's more yeah. so with ducks than than the upland birds that I've seen, but uh, a week, yeah. as long as, you know, the temperatures are cool and it's shady, um, I've seen them hang a duck by the bill, put a nail on the side of the old barn, and we had ducks hanging all over and a few geese up in Canada, and that's the way they did it. And they said that made for a tender bird, it improved the flavor of the bird. Um, but I don't know, that's just one of the things I've heard, and I've only seen it once when we were up uh, hunting in Manitoba. You know, but that was that was a long time ago. Yeah, years ago in, on a South Dakota hunt, we would one of the places we were staying at let us keep them in a barn. So it was cool in there. It was like like we said, keep it below forty degrees, so we don't get stuff growing in there. But those were some great pheasants. We'd let them hang in there. You know, the ones really? we got the first days, they were in there for three days, and um, they were they were good birds. So yeah. So we're ready to talk about big game a little bit. Yeah, let's move on to some big game. So when I started hunting, um, 11, 12 years old with my dad, and if we got a deer, everything was packaged in the freezer paper, the white, hard, paper with a wacky plastic like coating on the inside. And that's what we used. Um, you know, we'd have a, a processing set up so that the deer came in on this end, and by the time it got to this end, you were putting that meat into hard pap, uh, hard paper packages or um, freezing it for making sausage at a later date. Usually uh, Thanksgiving time was making sausage. So I've got a piece here of venison backstrap. I was successful and got a deer a couple Mondays ago, I took a day off, and my wife guided me, Benji. She That's a good deal. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, fold that camera down again so we can kind of watch and see what's going on there. Let me know when you can see it there. Okay. Baby. Just a little bit more. Okay. There you go. So I always put the, yeah. the piece of meat at an angle on the paper. And I take and make that first fold right over the top. 
I'm going to take my sides and bring my sides in. So I'm trying to keep as much air away from the meat as possible. And then I'm just going to fold it over and over. That in. Kind of like wrapping a Christmas present, I'm going to tuck that tail underneath and then use the uh, freezer tape. Can you see that okay, Benji? A little bit. You're a just... little grainy right now, but okay. I think the important part is, you know, freezer tape obviously is an important part because if you use just regular masking tape, it does not work when it gets really cold. It might not hold. Yep. And you broke up a little bit when you're talking about the freezer paper, but get actual freezer paper, good quality, thick paper with that wax part on the back that's the key and um, if you ever buy anything or get stuff from a butcher you will notice what Craig is doing right now he's writing probably what it is and the date that it went in on the stuff you know, just because we freeze it doesn't mean it's gonna last forever right so we got you know nine to twelve months of uh, kind of prime time to pull that out and, and eat that so that's actually that gonna be dinner tonight on, I got the invite in the mail, I'm sure. So I'll come up and have Wait, some backstrap. Head on up. You don't you don't need to wait for the paper invite. <laughs> but um, you know, the other alternative to the paper wrap, because you're still going to potentially get some air around your your meat, is to put that. into the vacuum sealer. And then you can draw all that air out of there and uh, down to the table here. See yet, Benji? Little, yep, that looks good. So he's vacuuming that out. Craig, you must have a lot of people on the server up there all of a sudden, but you broke up a little bit there, but he was just talking about it. And, one thing I do with the freezer wrapper too that I've done in the past is just use like saran wrap or just thin cellophane type material, wrap the meat in it and then put it in the freezer paper too. And that kind of gives an extra layer of protection to keep the air and stuff off of it too. So, so you double wrap. It. Double wrap it, yeah. And then if I, yeah. especially if I'm putting two, two steaks or something together, then I got to, it separates easier when I'm thawing it out. So I don't have quite mm -hmm. such a thick piece. Which is kind of nice too. So, I've uh, I've taken the hard paper wrapped meat and put those into a large gallon size Ziploc, squeezed as much of the air out, zip it shut, and that kind of reverse of what you were talking about, wrapping mm -hmm. it a second time, um, and that tends to help. But I have seen venison in this package last several years with no freezer burn it was definitely worth the investment in in that piece of equipment um we can put our burger in there after we grind it up and and seal the burger down so it's going to stay nice and fresh too um one of our other favorite methods for processing venison is to can it so this is a quart jar of canned elk. And uh, I tell you, you take a jar like that, you put it in a saucepan, heat it up, add a little thickening to it, you get an amazing gravy. Um, and when you, when you raw pack a jar, meaning just putting meat in there, you don't put any liquid. The meat forms its own juices from the cooking process. Um, this was always a treat in the fish house in the winter time, I'd take a metal bread pan and put in a layer of meat, a layer of potatoes, a layer of uh, carrots, some more meat, and um, cover it up with tin foil. And while the wood stove was heating up, I'd set that pan on top of the wood stove. And by lunchtime, it was smelling amazing in the fish house. And uh, we were able to, to to share that harvested venison with 
the guys out in the fish house and they were always surprised because they'd bring a sandwich or something and it's like no we had hot food <laughs> um this one's going to be a little bit foreign to you guys that's canned hamburger so at the end of deer season we would take the leftover burger we'd brown it up put it into a jar and can it that one we'd have to add a little bit of water to but if you want to make um, sloppy joes or pasta sauce or oh just about anything tacos you want to drain it for the tacos but um you, you could have a, a meal in a short period of time and this this stuff just sits on the shelf you guys can't quite see the the storage unit to my right but you know we've got a lot of canned vegetables and and venison that we've put it put up over the years um st patrick's day is a way off but uh this is corned venison and uh, there's a brining process <coughs> that you'd go through and uh, soak your meat in that and uh, the pickling spices and then you can it all up and you can have uh, corned beef hash for breakfast yeah. one morning and uh, make it all from from scratch so Let's that's the the three that i had for today benji i think that I guess canning that is one of those methods that it's gone by the wayside a little bit. My I used to can with my grandma all the time. And uh when when they moved off the farm, we still had cans of besides all the vegetables and stuff, but canned pork and canned beef and canned venison down in the basement that were multiple of years old. I'm sure mm -hmm. that got lost in the back of the pantry. But uh yeah, we could we still pulled those out. I know some of the my uncles still went in and sampled it and it was still good. So we did have a, a quick question or an ask about the vacuum sealer. You know, mm -hmm. that's one of those things that it's probably one of the best ways to preserve some of this food because it does get all the air out and the I bags agree. are thick. Um, mm -hmm. What are you talking about for cost and the cost of the bags and the cost of the actual machine, I guess? Usually a, a 40 count box of the bags are about, about 25 to 30 dollars depending on where you find them. the machine itself um i think this one here was like 75 bucks and up um maybe a little bit cheaper if you find them on on sale somewhere but uh we've used them for quite a few years now and uh it it, it just makes it so much nicer because you can look in the package and you can see what you're taking out um, I was going to bring in a pack and I forgot, but we do a lot of uh, stew meat uh, out of the hind legs of the deer. We don't care so much for the round or the sirloin steaks. So I'll take that meat and I'll cube it up into one inch cubes and we'll put two cups in your venison stew out of it. Oh, great. I, you know, one thing we didn't mention that uh, Bill just put a question in here about grouse. Did I lose you, ben Oh, why don't you try to shut your video off, Craig? We're, you're breaking up a little bit there, but so we get a little better audio. But Bill was asking or talking about for grouse and fish, he doesn't okay. have a vacuum sealer, so he uses that pint Ziploc bags and can fill them up with fish or grouse and then put water on them. I uh, hit a good tip to put those mm -hmm. on a tray yep. like a, a freezer tray and freeze them so they're kind of flat and they're not all bunched up in odd shapes um that's a, that's a great tip yep do that um and, and then also to portion okay. them out for a couple people so you know if you put you don't want to put three meals worth of fish in one bag if you're only going to eat one meal right so and you have to we're a family of two right now so mm -hmm. it doesn't make much sense uh if you notice that piece of back strap i left it whole um, I didn't cut the individual steaks out of that. We'll we'll make that decision when we get ready to prepare it, whether we're going to do uh, tips and gravy or we're going to do steaks or or what have you. And um, I think a, a bigger piece of meat stores better in the freezer. The more surface area you have exposed, the the greater the chance of freezer burning. 
So I just like to leave them in nice big chunks. And, and we package them down so there's a, like two steaks a person in there. And that's usually plenty for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, one of the other questions was, do you ever put anything in the bag before you seal it up? Like, you know, put a little spice or some cloves or something in there. I've, I've never tried that. I don't know if it, have you. I've, I've read about it, but I've always been a little bit afraid. What if I don't like the flavor that, that it put <laughs> into the fish or the game? Um, I can add seasonings to the, the game while it's cooking. Um, we have bought in a few marinades that, um, you know, if you get an older buck and he's a little bit tough, um, those marinades help break down. It's the, the citric acids that help tenderize it a little bit. Um, I don't know if you know what a meat mallet is, Benji. Oh, yeah. And uh, you put the piece of meat on your cutting board and you pound it out nice and flat and uh, season it up and whether you dredge it in flour or cornmeal or whatever you like to put on it, um, that tends to make it a little bit more uh, more tender. And I've shot a few of those bigger, tougher, older bucks. And uh, yeah, that's that's usually a challenge to to figure out how you're going to use that. A lot more burger out of those than than anything mm -hmm. else or stew meat. Um, my wife purchased a uh, Instapot pressure cooker. And she's learned to use that thing for a lot of different recipes now. And I don't think we've ever had a tough piece of meat come out of there. It just tenderizes everything up really nice. So for for folks that are worried about shooting a deer and it being tough, um, you know, you, there's ways you can cook it. Um, don't overcook it. You know, that that tends to be a way to to really firm up a piece of venison is if you over overcook it. Yeah. And uh, you know that's that doesn't have anything to do with the packaging, but just the preparation side. So I think that one's covered pretty good. I know with uh, with fish too, when you can fish or even pickle fish, they say to kind of undercook that a little bit because then it'll finish cooking in the canning process. And right. if if you cook it fully and then try to can it, you're going to get it a little tougher and rubbery because it's a little overcooked mm -hmm. actually. So yep. There's kind of a little balance to do there. I know a, a buddy. Yeah. I see someone asked about the canning book. Yeah, you, and you hit your cook. The, there. the, there's two main companies out there. Yeah, this one happens to be a ball, but there's also the Kerr. And uh, follow their directions and recipes. And we've always been very happy with the way stuff has turned out. We probably got at least two of the, the canning books for for different ideas on things. So, um, pressure cooker is the only way to put meat up. Um, yep. I know the old timers did it with hot water bath, but it's just the, the temperatures don't get high enough to kill all that bacteria. So I use the pressure cooker. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, universities, University of Colorado, I know Nebraska, I'm sure the U of M does too have a have recommendations on canning so if yeah like craig said if you're going to do meat pressure cooker is the way to do it and they have you know good ideas in there for for how long it needs to be at and what the temperature needs to be at for canning so yep just follow the time and the temperature and pressure settings and um when we're canning i sit right next to the stove so i can keep an eye on the pressure on the jars and reduce the heat if I need to drop the pressure a little bit. But, you know, you guys can put up a good winter supply of of meat by by doing some of these simple things, the 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 freezing, the the wrapping, the the canning. Um I can remember canned venison as a kid and it was always such a treat when uh, my mom would open up a can of that. So um give it a try. And I'd like to remind people too, we have put, or, well, we haven't. Cassie and uh, Amber in the background have been putting the links in the chat function. So if you want to go there and click on any of those links to save them, 
or you can simply do a Google search and you'll find some stuff on there also. I know my buddy Sean out in Colorado that uh, every time I go out there and, and visit, uh, do a little fishing or hunting with him, he loves he loves to make jerky and smoke fish. You know, he's got a big Traeger <laughs> smoker and uh, we'll sit out there for, for a day and smoke some stuff up and vacuum steal stuff up and it's great to be able to bring that home, that's for sure. It's throw in the freezer will last, last for a long time. So We've made a lot of different jerkies over the years. Um, there's some really good seasoning kits that are available that you can, you know, use on your, your meat, either um, slicing the meat and making your jerky or taking your ground meat and using a jerky shooter. And we've done a lot of that, made sticks. Um, I've got a really nice uh, big meat grinder that um, you, it's got a sausage stuffer attachment that you can put your burger into the individual bags. And um, that that makes the, the process of packaging your ground meat up really nice. Um, you know, but you don't have to buy everything the first season. Um, I used to take my trimmings down to a local butcher shop and it was nice and clean and I'd like to get this ground and he'd take it in the back room, dump it into the grinder and within 30 minutes I had a a box of um, ground meat. If I wanted them to package it, it would be just a little bit more, but um, I, I've had them package it for me before too and uh, just makes a a nice way to use up some of those lesser cuts. Um, we used to make a lot of breakfast sausage and uh, we found the seasoning mixes at the, the local outdoor store and seasoned up 25 pounds and run it through the grinder and we'd make uh, like sausage links. We'd make uh, bulk sausage that you could use for, for whatever. Um, never got too much into stuffed casings um we did it one year and then you got to smoke it and um it just seemed like a lot of work for me but um yeah you know it's just a way to to utilize that game up but uh you know deer season is just what two days away start saturday start saturday yeah so, so get your blaze plan. orange out mine's hang, hanging on the line right now airing out a little bit you know, and, our local uh, butch, butcher shop here too sells you know one of the things like i've made summer sausage and stuff before with deer it's um adding some pork fat to it if you're making like a summer sausage or something like that is also nice you can go to like a butcher shop and either have them grind it for you if you don't have a grinder or you can grind it and a lot of them will sell the um seasoning packages right there it's a you know this they give you a package it'll season you know 10 pounds of meat or whatever and, and you can make that either at home you know stuff it yourself and and cook it in the oven the right way or smoke it or however you want to do that so i just mm -hmm. one other question come in bill had another great point with um grouse or this works with pheasants too but he likes to debone them the breast debone them before they freeze them if he does put the wings or legs in the bag with him, he'll put them between the breast. That way he doesn't have to worry about getting a uh, bag puncture from a broken bone mm -hmm. or something like that. That's also a, a good tip to keep in mind, so. Yep. But it's all very good food. It's nutritious. It's low in saturated fats. Um, we've eaten a lot of stuff over the years and uh, my family's been gracious enough to try a little bit of everything that I've ever brought in home from deer, bear, moose, elk, um, even snapping turtle. Oh, uh, I love snapping really turtle. Good eating, you know? And uh, I, I deboned it and I deep fried it and it was just little turtle nuggets and it was good, you know? Yeah. So I don't, I don't well, that's pretty much in there, there so... Benji. I don't see any Thanks questions there. So, in today and... yeah. Thanks. Like like you know, Craig was saying, it's a uh, you know you're going out and doing the hard work of of harvesting animal and uh, 
making good use of it is important. So we wish, wish everybody luck in a successful hunting season. And, you know, if you have any questions, Craig has his phone number up there. You can always reach out to me through the mndnr.gov slash discover website, and I can pass his information on to you too. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us. Great job, Craig. Thank you for showing us your kitchen and, and how you do that stuff. And, um, Welcome everybody to attend us next week. We are talking about fat tire mountain biking in the winter. So good talk on that. So hope everybody has a good weekend, successful hunting out there, and hopefully we'll see you next Wednesday. Be safe out there, guys.